Hello fellow scholars, welcome back to the Ripe Good Scholar YouTube channel. My name is Sarah. Today we're going to be working through Act 3 of A Midsummer Night's Dream. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves what happened so far. Hermia and Lysander have run off into the forest for love. Demetrius chases after Hermia and Helena chases after him. Oberon and Titania are fighting over a changeling child. To get revenge, Oberon sends Puck to get a flower with a love potion in it. While Puck is gone, Oberon sees poor Helena pining after Demetrius, so he has Puck charm the Athenians. But Puck charms Lysander, who falls in love with Helena by mistake, and leaves Hermia alone in the woods. Oh, and there are some actors preparing for a play. And with that refresher out of the way, let's move on to Act 3, Scene 1. The troupe of actors have found the perfect clearing for their rehearsal, the same clearing where Titania is sleeping. Bottom and the other actors are concerned that the ladies in the audience will be afraid of Pyramus killing himself with a sword, and of course the lion. They decide not to have Pyramus kill himself and write two prologues that explain Pyramus and the lion, so the ladies won't be afraid. Masters, you ought to consider with yourself to bring in, God shield us, a lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is not a more fearful wildfowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Then, they worry about how to have a scene in the moonlight. Fortunately, the moon will be shining that night. Next, they worry about how to have a wall in the chamber. Bottom explains how they can turn a person into a suitable wall. With that, they are ready to start rehearsal. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall. Let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of a fairy queen? What a play toward! I'll be an auditor, and actor too, perhaps if I see cause. Puck decides to have a little fun, and while Bottom is off stage, he transforms Bottom's head into that of a donkey. All the actors are terrified and run away screaming, as you would. Bottom questions what has them so scared, he assumes it's some sort of trick. They run back in briefly to explain that he has a donkey head before running away again. Bottom still doesn't believe him and decides to sing a song to prove he isn't scared. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Oh, Bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an asset of your own, do you? Bless thee, Bottom, bless thee, thou art translated. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place and do what they can. I will walk up and down here and I will sing, that they shall hear I am not afraid. This is when Titania wakes up, sees Bottom, and immediately falls in love. I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force, perforce, doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Bottom doubts that she loves him because he's so ugly, you know, the whole donkey head, plus she just popped out of nowhere. She tells him he's beautiful and calls forth her fairies to take care of him. Out of this wood, do not desire to go, thou shalt remain here. Whether that will or no, I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore go with me, I'll give thee my fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. 
and I will purge thy mortal grossness, so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth, mustard seed. So that's a thing. Um, moving on to act three, scene two. Oberon wonders how his plan is working. Puck comes over and explains how he gave Bottom a donkey head and Titania fell in love with him. Oberon thinks that's hilarious. My mistress with a monster is in love, near to her closer and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals, that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day, the shallowest thick skin of the barren sort who Pyramus presented in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's knoll I fixed on his head, anon this thisbe must be answered. And forth my mimic comes, when they him spy, as wild geese that creeping fowler eye, or russet pated choffs, many in sort rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky. So at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our stamp here, o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries and help from Athens calls. Their sense, thus weak, lost with their fears, thus strong, may Made senseless things begin to do them wrong, for briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yielders all things catch. I led them on in distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When, in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked straight away, and loved an ass. Shakespeare repeats things a lot. Oberon asks how his plans with the Athenians went and Puck explains that he did exactly what he was told. This is when Hermia and Demetrius walk on the scene, and Oberon finds out that Puck put the flower juice into the wrong dude's eyes. Hermia is mad because she thinks Demetrius killed Lysander. He tells her he didn't, but she's still not real happy at the moment. Demetrius realizes he can't make her happy, so he might as well just go to sleep. Demetrius is surely the prize to be won here. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray me, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so, see no more whether he be dead or no. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, for which in some slight measure it will pay. I, for this tender here, I make some stay. Oberon scolds Puck for messing up the Athenian plan. I mean, he had one job. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love's sight. Of thy misprision, some perforce ensue, some true love turned, and not false turned true. Oberon sends Puck to go and get Helena while he puts some of the flower juice in Demetrius's eye. Puck brings back Helena with Lysander in tow. Lysander is still trying to explain that he is not wooing her out of scorn. Demetrius wakes up and also falls in love with Helena. Although wouldn't it have been fantastic if he had seen Lysander first. When Demetrius starts confessing his love, Helena becomes even more irate because now everyone is making fun of her. They both swear they're not and try to get the other to deny his love. Oh spite, oh hell, I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do, but you must join in souls and mock me too? If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so. To vow and swear and super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You are both rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience all to make you sport. 
You are unkind, Demetrius, be not so, for you love Hermia, this you and I know, and here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield up to my part, and yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. <sighs> Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia, I will none. If I e'er loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her is but as guestwise sojourned, and now to Helen it is home returned, and there to remain. I mean, I'm proud of Helena for telling them off because that was pretty epic. Hermia enters the scene and is very relieved to find Lysander. Lysander brushes her off for Helena. Helena starts yelling at Hermia for being in on this mean trick. Hermia doesn't understand anything of what's going on, and she thinks everyone is trying to trick her. <laughs> Yay, they're such good friends. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate. So we grew together, like a double cherry seeming parted, but yet a, a union in partition, two lovely berries molded on one stem. So, with two seeming bodies but one heart, two of the first, like coats of heraldry, do but to one and crowned with one crest. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, tis not maidenly. Our sex, as well as I, may chide you for it, though I do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Lysander starts defending Helena, and Demetrius can't be shown up, so the two men keep escalating their love competition until the idea comes out that they should kill Hermia. Okay, <laughs> they decide that's a little extreme. But Hermia is obviously still hurt. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll trust not your word. What, should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll harm her so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Oh me, what news, my love? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Hermia and Helena start yelling at each other now. Hermia is mad that Helena stole her love. Helena still thinks this is all some sort of cruel joke. Their argument escalates to near violence until the men intervene and defend Helena. And are you so grown in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. After stopping Hermia from viciously attacking Helena and delivering the best line, though she be but little, she is fierce. Lysander and Demetrius leave, asking Helena to follow them. Helena storms off in a totally different direction, and then Hermia goes on her own way. Oberon turns to Puck because he really messed this one up, and then tells him how to fix it. He tells Puck to cast a fog throughout the forest and taunt the men into running around until they tire themselves out. He gives Puck an herb that will make this all seem like a dream and return Lysander to his right mind. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. High, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The starry welkin cover thou anon with a drooping fog as black as Acheron. 
and lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like two Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfelling sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep, then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property to take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight when they next wake all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision and back to athens shall the lovers wend with league whose date till death shall never end whiles i in this affair do thee employ i'll to my queen and beg her indian boy then I will her charmed eye released from monster's view. All things shall be peace. Puck does just that and conveniently lays the ladies down next to the boys. Just gonna keep everybody, everybody together. Now, on the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye and the country proverb known that every man shall take his own in your waking shall be known jack shall have jill not shall go ill the man shall have his mare again and all shall be well and we'll have to wait until next time to see if puck can fix all this in act four let me know your thoughts opinions questions comments all down below if you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and make sure to turn on notifications. You don't want to miss the next video. If you want some more Shakespeare fun in the meantime, check out my blog at ripegoodscholar.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All the links are down below. I also have a podcast I do with my husband. It's called Breaking Bard, where we talk about all sorts of fun Shakespeare shenanigans. Um, check that all out. Links all down below and I will see you all next time. Remember, go wisely and go slowly. Those who rush, stumble and fall.